um, last Wednesday uh, talking about uh, the poetry of World War I. Um, we're talking about poems written in the period 1914 to 1918, pretty much the, the period uh, of the First World War. This is a, a, a period that we've already had uh, a certain amount to say about. It is the period in which Fro Frost starts writing, uh, publishes A Boy's Will in London and then north of Boston <coughs> in 1915. Uh, it's the same period uh, in which uh, Yeats's work uh, undergoes its uh, uh, important uh, stylistic shift uh, in development in the volume called Responsibilities uh, and uh, other uh, books from the, the teens uh, exemplified in that little poem, A Coat. Um, <coughs> it is a period uh, in which, uh, in London itself, are gathered uh, Frost, uh, Yeats, Pound, uh, and Eliot, uh, all uh, poets we'll uh, study, uh, not simply gathered but interacting, talking to each other, reading each other's work, uh, and giving each other uh, ideas and criticism. Uh, another figure uh, in this uh, milieu and of this moment uh, is the poet H.D. Uh, here she is uh, in a uh <coughs> photo from uh, 1915 uh, with, a, with a locket uh, in a poetical pose. Uh, let, let's see, we've, I've got some other photos of the poet here. Let's see. This is as an older woman, uh, and <laughs> in a familiar place, uh, seated. She's on the left, or, right, or on your left, my right, uh, with uh, her companion, Briar, right here. And that nice man in the middle uh, is one of my predecessors in this position, Norman Holmes Pearson, uh, a professor of modern poetry, one of the founders of American Studies at Yale, uh, and one of the um, uh, one of the people um, involved in the creation of the incredible archive of modern poetry that is the Beinecke Library, uh, where we have the papers of Ezra Pound, H. D. Uh, lots of lots of uh, materials from Williams, uh, um, um, uh, um, I'm, I'm getting stuck here, uh, Langston Hughes, uh, and many other figures. Let's see, and there, yeah, there she is uh, on her 70th birthday uh, in the nave of Sterling. Um, well, <coughs> and this is. This is over in Beinecke, too. Uh, that is her death mask. Well, we've gone a long way from that uh, young woman with a locket uh, to this point. Uh, uh, let's return to her in her youth. Uh, this is uh, uh, also over in Beinecke. It's a, it's a photo of uh, H.D., uh, and it is inscribed to Marianne Moore, uh, her friend uh, and Pound's friend. Uh, on, your, on your handout, you'll see um, the interesting anecdote <coughs> relayed from Hilda Doolittle's autobiographies. <coughs> uh, I had never heard of Ver Libre until I was discovered by Ezra Pound. Pound did a lot <coughs> for modern poetry, including naming H.D. Uh, I did a few poems that I don't think Ezra liked, but later he was beautiful about my first authentic verses and sent my poems in for me to Miss Monroe, that is Harriet Monroe, the editor, very powerful woman of Poetry <laughs> Magazine. He signed them for me, H.D. Imagiste. Uh, the name seems to have stuck somehow. Uh, well, this, this is a wonderful anecdote, uh, sometimes told differently, uh, in which uh, Pound and H.D., as she would come to be known, uh, were uh, conversing about her poems 
uh, and uh, in a coffee shop and pound uh, put uh, at the uh, end of uh, HD's poems uh, a new signature to them, uh, HD uh, that is, um, uh, and, and uh, at the same time name the kind of poet she was, imagiste, uh, uh, and uh, promptly uh, since Pound is a great entrepreneur, sent the poems off to uh, be published uh, and to found a movement. <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, and, and uh, telling story. Um, I suppose if uh, this is Poetry Magazine, uh, its cover, where you see uh, uh, poems uh, by Pound uh, and others uh, that included <coughs> HD's work in the same volume. Uh, there's, uh, there are a couple things to be said about this, this little anecdote. Well, first of all, the, there's the kind of uh, complicated literary exchange of uh, a man telling a woman uh, what to call herself uh, and, and, in fact, doing it for her and, and sending it, uh, uh, her name and her work uh, to be published. <coughs> The, uh, the name Amagiste uh, is, is funny. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it seems to, uh, uh, well, it seems to evoke something excitingly uh, and pretentiously foreign. Uh, and, and you could remember uh, the force of French painting in this period. Uh, uh, you know, everything that was modern came from Paris, it seemed. Uh, and here is uh, Pound trying to, in effect, create something, uh, uh, some similar kind of uh, public relations excitement for poetry. <coughs> uh, Amagiste uh, highlights, well, it highlights the word image, uh, and it highlights the visual, uh, as if poetry were a kind of painting. Uh, that's important. Uh, and then there's the, uh, the fact of, uh, uh, Hilda Doolittle's uh, transformation into HD. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, is the name Hilda Doolittle insufficiently poetic? <coughs> uh, the the uh, compression of that kind of wonderfully homely American name uh, into the enigmatic uh, initials HD seems emblematic of. Uh, imagist aesthetics in general, which depend on the uh, you know uh, radical compression uh, of of uh, language and the uh, 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 conversion uh, of of um, well uh, the prosaic and everyday to the essential. Uh, and you could you could say that uh, here here Pound is trying to uh, do something. Uh, with the same uh, ideal of extreme economy with uh, uh, HD's name. Well, uh, what was imagism? Uh, this is, uh, um, well, uh, th these are, these are um, copies of um, uh, HD's poems as they appeared in Poetry Magazine, uh, the poem Hermes of the Ways. Um, <coughs> HD was, uh, and there's, there's her initials right here, uh, this new pen name uh, she went under. Uh, she uh, uh, is writing, even uh, in this very early phase, uh, poems that have classical subjects and antecedents and are sometimes, uh, in fact, uh, translations from uh, classic sources uh, from the uh, Greek anthology and others. Uh, here's one epigram after the Greek, and then here's HD's name, uh, followed by the amagiste in quotation marks uh, 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 identification that Pound has introduced. Um, imagism was uh, initially marketed, I think that's, that's the fair word to use, uh, in a series of anthologies that, that collected this, this new, exciting, uh, representatively, it seemed, modern poetry <coughs> uh, in an anthology called Des Amagistes, uh, again, uh, Frenchified. Uh, and then uh, uh, you can see this is from 1914, and it's published in London and New York. And then, uh, well, uh, I'll tell you its table of contents. It's got um, 
poems uh, by uh, H.D.'s uh, friend and lover, uh, also a soldier poet, Richard Aldington, uh, H.D. herself, uh, F.S. Flint and others, including Amy Lowell and uh, William Carlos Williams, James Joyce is, appears here, and Ezra Pound, uh, who uh, 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 here has uh, at least a, a couple poems that you've read for today. Uh, this was followed a little bit later by this book called uh, Some Imagist Poets, 1915. At this point, Pound uh, is no longer the uh, master uh, entrepreneur, uh, and the movement has rather been taken over by uh, the very amply represented Amy Lowell, uh, who uh, uh, has become the primary uh, exponent of imagism uh, already by 1915, and Pound uh, has, has more or less despaired of uh, his own creation, imagism, and now complains of it as being merely amagism. Uh, as he referred to it. <coughs> uh, Amy, uh, well, you, you can see in this uh, a kind of, uh, uh, oh, you know, envy and competition on Pound's part. He, you know, he's, he's unhappy that his, his, uh, um, his little group has been taken over by Amy Lowell, uh, and so he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, Amy Lowell herself would later become uh, uh, distressed at the proliferation of imagism and imagists and attempt to copyright the name, uh, which she was unable to do. Well, uh, this is uh, her, uh, her longish uh, uh, poetics uh, presented as a preface to that volume, and I uh, recommend it to you. It's an interesting um, statement of uh, imagism. Uh, and here's a photo of Pound from this same period. Uh, Pound, uh, despite uh, Amy Lowell's taking over of imagism, remains the, the real theorist of, of uh, imagism and, and the, uh, the one whose formulations uh, we still return to, to understand what imagism was, and uh, to an extent to understand some of the essential um, aesthetic ideas and criteria of, of modern poetry. On your uh, handout, you have, you have Pound's rules, he liked to make rules, uh, for, for writing an imagist poem. Uh, and they're, happily, there are just three of them, <coughs> not too many. Uh, one, uh, direct treatment of the thing, whether subjective or objective. Two, to use absolutely no word that did not contribute to the presentation. You can see even in, in his uh, uh, telegraphic uh, uh, rules here, he's trying to be uh, economical. And three, as regarding rhythm, to compose in sequence of the musical phrase, not in sequence of a metronome. Well, uh, these are each suggestive and, as I say, important ideas, and they're, they're worth uh, dwelling on uh, to understand some of what uh, directs Pound's uh, thinking uh, and uh, some of Pound's important influence early on in the uh, uh, development of modern poetry. First of all, that focus on the thing. Uh, a poem is imagined here as an image of a thing. Uh, th there, there's, there's a kind of empiricism in this, isn't there? Uh, a kind of vaguely scientific language. Uh, and if you look in Pound's retrospect, when he goes back and, and reprints some of his, his writing about imagism and, and reflects on it uh, in that essay that's in the back of your anthology, you'll see Pound talking about um, uh, his wish to ally poetry with science rather than advertisement. Uh, and, and, and here you can see him really trying to do so in the stress on objectivity or, or uh, uh, the, the, the aim of objectivity. Uh, notice that the thing may be, as he says, subjective or objective. Uh, but 
uh, when we call it a thing, uh, this has the effect of turning even the subjective into something objective, uh, something um, oddly objective. And there's also uh, in that, that first rule a kind of emphasis on directness, you know, direct treatment of the thing. Uh, that's important. Uh, all of this leads to, uh, in Pound's uh, second uh, principle there, the uh, ideal of concision, uh, of efficiency. Uh, nothing that does not contribute to the presentation. You know, uh, Hilda Doolittle, your name is too long, HD. Uh, presentation. Pound doesn't say representation. Uh, he says presentation. Uh, again, there's, there's an, uh, an emphasis on um, immediacy, uh, directness on, on uh, an ideal of presence, if you will. There is in Pound a will to override or do away with mediation, uh, to bypass, <laughs> in a way, the medium, to make the word uh, a thing, to make the word an image and the image a thing. Uh, direct uh, also implies a kind of stripping down of rhetorical ornament. Uh, the idea, uh, again, that we saw in Frost, that the truth is something you arrive at through reduction, uh, or uh, in, in Yeats's little poem, A Coat. Uh, and, and remember that, that Yeats and Frost are coming to these ideas at just the same time that uh, Pound is finding these formulations for his own poetics. <coughs> uh, these ideas uh, in Frost, in Stevens, uh, excuse me, uh, in Frost, in uh, Yeats, not in Stevens, uh, importantly, uh, uh, and uh, here uh, centrally uh, expressed by Pound, these ideas all point to a kind of radical skepticism in modern poetry towards imagination and towards rhetoric. Uh, there's a skepticism about poetry's own illusion-making uh, powers. Uh, there's a kind of linguistic skepticism here. Uh, and and uh, good poetry uh, is, uh, uh, has, has, uh, uh, has a kind of ascetic dimension uh, for Pound, or so it seems at this point. Uh, finally, that third point about prosody, uh, that's important too. What Pound says, uh, calls the kind of priority of the musical phrase over the sequence of the metronome. Um, the musical phrase over a kind of bigger uh, and regularized pattern, uh, that's a kind of privileging of the part, the smaller thing uh, over the whole, <coughs> Uh, and certainly over uh, repetition. It's a privileging of individual detail over pattern uh, or sequence. Uh, it's it's a, a privileging of, of this idea of the musical phrase over the abstract uh, or a kind of continuous structure, um, which, is, which is viewed as, as a kind of uh, mechanical discipline. Um, all of these ideas are, are rehearsed uh, again uh, by Amy Lowell uh, and uh, given sometimes somewhat different emphases, and you can compare her uh, account. Well, let's, uh, let's look at some of H.D.'s poems uh, to uh, see imagism at work, uh, as it were, uh, at least uh, as practiced by H.D. <coughs> the, a number of the uh, early poems here uh, in your anthology come from her book, Sea Garden, uh, a wonderful and fascinating first book um, that imagines the poems themselves as constituting together a kind of, well, sea garden, a kind of enclosed uh, space. Uh, that offers reflection on symbolic objects that suggest a kind of allegory of poetic activity for H.D., in which flowers stand for kinds of poems 
certainly kinds of feeling. Uh, and the garden itself constitutes a certain kind of pastoral imaginative space. Uh, and H.D. has uh, classical sources for this, Greek models for this, uh, and the, the crucial poet for her uh, is Sappho. Uh, and like Sappho, H.D. Uh, is a lyric poet of sexual desire. Uh, you, you can see her, her um, uh, translation of, of Sappho's fragment 68 on page 389. Uh, let's look at the, uh, the poem Garden on 396, uh, which gives a, a sense of, of H.D.'s aesthetic, uh, aesthetic, aesthetic program. Uh, <coughs> here there's a, an address to, uh, to the rose, a uh, traditional symbol of romantic beauty. You are clear, O rose cut in rock, hard as the descent of hail. I could scrape the color from the petals like spilt dye from a rock. If I could break you, I could break a tree. If I could stir, I could break a tree. I could break you. O oh wind, rend open the heat. Cut apart the heat, rend it to tatters. Fruit cannot drop through this thick air. Fruit cannot fall into heat that presses up and blunts the points of pears and rounds the grapes. Cut the heat, plow through it, turning it on either side of your path. The, the rose, image of romantic beauty, you could compare it to uh, uh, the rose in, in Yeats's early poems. Uh, but here the image is transformed. H.D.'s uh, emphasis is not on its softness or sweetness or uh, sensual abundance, its richness of color or touch. Uh, instead, the rose is clear <coughs> and hard, uh, just as an imagist poem is supposed to be. It is cut in rock. Uh, you could compare it to uh, uh, C. Rose on, on 395, the, the page before, rose, harsh rose, marred with stint of per petals, meager flower, thin, sparse of leaf, where again it seems H.D. Uh, is writing about her poem uh, in, and its properties. Uh, stunted with small leaf, you are flung on the sand, you are lifted in the crisp sand that drives in the wind. Can the spice rose drip such acrid fragrance <coughs> hardened in a leaf. This is a, a, a po poetry that wishes to convey to us uh, an acrid fragrance uh, in, in hardened forms. Uh, in, in Garden, <coughs> well, two, H.D. Uh, is interested in, in a kind of experience that is harsh or astringent. Uh, that uh, would open itself to elemental forces, uh, here represented by the wind, uh, uh, forces that, that suggest human passion as much as weather, uh, and, and uh, that would transform uh, and um, uh, transform the poet's torpor and, and heat. Uh, and and uh, uh, do so specifically through the action of cutting, which is important. <coughs> uh, here, uh, and really in all these early poems, H.D.'s poems uh, take place as a kind of lyric drama of apostrophe. Apostrophe, that is, the act of address uh, through which uh, a speaker finds her voice uh, by speaking in some relation to a part of the object world, speaking to a thing uh, which she identifies with or struggles against or, or both, uh, as is the case, I think, in, in the poems I've just read. Uh, here, here, too, you can see these, these, uh, these images in, in H.D.'s poems as, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, things subjective or objective, to take Pound's uh, phrase. 
the extreme compression of these poems expresses a kind of wish for intensity, as if by compacting things you made them more fierce. Uh, sometimes a wish for breaking or, or cutting uh, and, and, and uh, uh, you might say fragmenting of things to get down to essential parts, uh, <coughs> to do away with the, um, let's say, the lassitude of mere rhetoric uh, and to cut to what is essential. Well, um, Oread is, is uh, maybe uh, uh, H.D.'s most famous uh, poem from her early work uh, and, and uh, a poem um, often presented as, as a uh, uh, paradigm of imagism. Uh, if so, it makes us see uh, imagism in somewhat different terms from those Pound presented. Uh, it is, like the other poems I've just been discussing, a kind of dramatic monologue, uh, which is not something that, that Pound's ideas emphasize. Uh, here, Oread is the name for a wood nymph, and uh, it indicates the, the speaker of the poem who says, Whirl up, sea. Whirl your pointed pines, splash your great pines on our rocks, hurl your green over us, cover us with your pools of fur. Again, there's a, a, a kind of uh, uh, lyric act of apostrophe of address where uh, what is implored uh, would be a kind of um, overwhelming experience. Uh, who or what exactly is uh, Oread, uh, is this nymph addressing? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, is she speaking, in fact, to the sea, as she seems to be, whirl up sea, splash your pines over us? Or is she speaking to the woods and the pines as if they were the sea? Uh, I, it's hard to decide. It is um, <coughs> a poem that presents a kind of enigma on that level uh, and um, uh, doesn't uh, uh, resolve the question it provokes. The very brevity of the poem uh, expresses a, a kind of wish for intensity that is right on the edge of canceling the poem you could say, uh, uh, leaving us nothing there uh, at all. Um, uh, a speaker, in this case, who wishes to be covered up, to be subject to uh, a greater force. Uh, and the uh, 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 poem leaves us with this cognitive problem, uh, the difficulty of uh, identifying what is figure or ground, what is uh, literal or uh, what is uh, metaphor, um, that is, whether she is speaking to sea or pines, seeing the sea like pines or the pines like the sea. Uh, the pool is another uh, uh, enigmatic uh, uh, poem uh, here, uh, uh, one that poses uh, questions. Well, this. Uh, this problem that Oread raises is, in fact, one that you see in other imagist poems. Um, the question of what is literal and what is figurative. Um, <coughs> Pound, again, uh, theorizes this, uh, the, the effects uh, that I'm trying to describe uh, in the uh, middle quotation on your handout, he speaks of uh, the idea of instantaneity, or suddenness. Uh, he talks about the poem as constituting a complex of elements held together, uh, made in some sense simultaneous with one another. Uh, rather, you know, as if, as, as uh, uh, Oread holds sea and pines together in a way um, that asks us to see these elements as joined. Uh, Pound says, 
An image is that which presents an intellectual and emotional complex in an instant of time. And, it, it, and when he uses that word complex, it, it has uh, perhaps uh, certain uh, resonances uh, from psychoanalysis uh, and also perhaps from uh, 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 chemistry. <coughs> uh, it is the presentation of such a complex instantaneously which gives that sense of sudden liberation, that sense of freedom from time limits and space limits, that sense of sudden growth which we experience in the presence of the greatest works of art. And then he says, one of my favorite quotations, it is better to present one image in a lifetime than to produce voluminous works. Uh, <coughs> um, the, uh, uh, you, you could see Oread as a poem uh, wishing for and, and uh, seeking that sense of sudden liberation that Pound uh, talks about here. Uh, it's important, uh, again, that Pound emphasizes uh, presentation. It is the presentation rather than the representation of such a complex, um, as he describes it. Uh, how is presentation different from representation? Uh, for Pound, the literary image is not uh, a memory of a prior reality, uh, a reflection, but is rather something more like a new experience itself, not uh, an imitation of a thing, uh, but itself a kind of thing. Uh, again, in Pound, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of, as, as Pound thinks about these things, there's a drive specifically through technique to arrive at a kind of transparency beyond technique. Uh, this is also, uh, it should be emphasized, a, a, uh, a romantic project. Uh, uh, the, the image uh, gives a kind of epiphany, a visionary experience for both poet and reader, gives us sudden liberation from historical particularities of, of place and of time. Uh, let's look at, at Pound's own poem, uh, In a Station of the Metro, uh, which is on page 351, uh, as an um, uh, important test case uh, and example uh, for this poetics. It has the honor of being the, the uh, 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 shortest famous poem in, in modern poetry. You can memorize it. <coughs> uh, in a station of the metro, and, and wonderfully, when I've said the title, I've already said a third of the poem, uh, the apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet black bow. In a station of the metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, semicolon, petals on a wet black bow. Not many elements. The title, how does it function? Uh, it functions as a kind of locator. Uh, it places us somewhere. It places us specifically in the Paris underground in a station of the metro. Uh, as I said, that, that title really is, um, well, you could understand it as uh, standing outside the poem or really as uh, uh, part of the poem itself. Lines one and two, again, pose for us this question of what is the figure and what is the ground? What is being observed and what is, it, what is, uh, what is the metaphor uh, it is generating? Are we in fact, well, are these, is Pound observing faces and comparing them to petals on a wet black bough? Uh, is he seeing both those things in some sense? Uh, we have here two elements joined and compressed radically. 
Um, probably it's wrong to speak here of metaphor or, for that matter, simile, uh, but rather we can use the word that Pound uses, image, uh, or as he would later call it, ideogram, uh, borrowing from his ideas about uh, Chinese writing. Uh, the key to this poem, uh, as uh, to other Poundian poems, is syntax. Syntax is the temporal ordering of language, uh, the ordering of a sentence's unfolding and consequently the definition of its elements and the relationships among them. Uh, Pound has here a kind of abbreviated parataxis, that is, uh, a syntax of series. Here, uh, only two elements uh, uh, are in that series. Uh, the series is joined by an and, usually, uh, but here there is no and. Uh, here the syntax is uh, compressed uh, in the service of rendering what is, in effect, a new kind of perception. Uh, a perception that is modern, urban, of the crowd, momentary, but also, as Pound conceives it, timeless, uh, pointing us elusively to historical and cultural overlays. We're in Paris, but this literary form draws on Japanese verse models and Japanese pictorial aesthetics. The time is now, the present, these faces. Uh, this is self-consciously an image or picture of modernity, but it's also the picture of an underground that inevitably recalls the classical underworld, and so uh, also recalls the long poetic history of comparing dead souls to leaves, which you find in Homer. Virgil, Dante, Milton. Uh, here uh, it's as if an epic simile from one of those great poems had been taken out uh, and, and presented uh, to us uh, in fragmentary form. All of this, this, this kind of uh, rich, elusive overlay, is created through a kind of stripping down to the poem's uh, essential primary elements. Uh, Pound gives us the story of the poem's composition here, uh, which, whether it's true or not, uh, is an important poetic fable uh, that, that, in a sense, stands behind this poem. He says, three years ago, in your footnote, in Paris, I got out of a metro train at La Concorde and saw suddenly a beautiful face, and then another, and another, and then a beautiful child's face, and then another beautiful woman, you know, a whole series. Uh, uh, and I tried all that day to find words for what this had meant to me, and I could not find any words that seemed to me worthy or as lovely as that sudden emotion, again, suddenness. In that evening, I was still trying, and I found suddenly, another experience of suddenness, the expression. I do not mean that I found words, but there came an equation, not in speech, but in little splotches of color. The one-image poem is a form of a, a superposition. Uh, that is to say, it is one idea uh, getting out of the impasse in which I had been left by my metro emotion. I wrote a 30-line poem and destroyed it. Six months later, I made a poem half that length. A year later, I made the following hoku-like or haiku-like sentence. Uh, so, uh, there, interestingly, this a uh, poem that purports to present, uh, and present again is the right word, rather than represent, uh, a moment of intense, vivid, spontaneous emotion is arrived at, as Pound describes it, through laborious technique uh, and over time. Uh, and, and the technique is concentrated specifically on what? Compression, cutting things down and eliminating words. Uh, again, uh, as in Frost mowing, uh, 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 the truth is, is something you get down to uh, by cutting away rhetorical ornament. Um, <coughs> Pound takes Japanese and Chinese poetries uh, as models for this aesthetics of compression. 
And uh, it's worth uh, stressing that, uh, on the one hand, Pound is, is polemically uh, writing in protest against late 19th century uh, drawing rooms that are crowded with bric-a-brac uh, and the ornamental aestheticism of, uh, uh, well, of uh, poets such as Swinburne or even the early Yeats. Uh, and yet, Pound's taste for Japanese and Chinese art comes right out of uh, Victorian decadence. Uh, and, and, well, you can, you can see this yourselves uh, if you look at the paintings uh, of James Whistler uh, and others. Uh, Pound is, is uh, um, a polemical modernist artist who is also really, uh, as he looks right here, a Victorian decadent. <coughs> uh, for Pound, um, Compression in Japanese and Chinese uh, poems uh, means implication, and that's what he's really interested in getting at. Uh, in your uh, RAS handout, uh, you'll see his translation of Li Po's uh, Jewel Stairs Grievance, as Pound renders it. Uh, in, in Pound's handling, he says, The jeweled steps are already quite white with dew. Again, this is a dramatic monologue. It is so late that the dew soaks my gauze stockings, and I let down the crystal curtain and watch the moon through the clear autumn. <laughs> and then Pound, uh, ever the uh, teacher uh, in his poems as elsewhere, says uh, on, on, uh, in his uh, uh, presentation of this poem, note, uh, jewel stairs, therefore, a palace. Grievance, therefore, there's something to complain of. <coughs> Gauze stockings, therefore, a court lady was doing the complaining, not a servant uh, who complains. Clear autumn, therefore, he, he for whom she was waiting, has no excuse on account of the weather. <laughs> <laughs> also, she has come early, for the dew has not merely whitened the stairs, but has soaked her stockings. The poem is especially prized because she utters no direct reproach. Uh, here, uh, as Pound uh, unfolds it for us, uh, does his explaining for us, the human situ situation is inferred from the scene uh, because it is so exactly rendered. Uh, and the power of sentiment is felt not through its direct expression, but rather through a kind of deliberate restraint. The poem is especially prized because she utters no direct reproach. Uh, narrative here in this poem, as in uh, other instances of um, uh, Pound's work, is displaced by the pictorial, or, or you might say is, is not so much displaced as condensed in it. Uh, uh, all that matters of the story of a lover's grief can be told in a quatrain. Well, uh, I'm going to uh, finish in just a moment, but I, I want to suggest um, uh, a further dimension to uh, this um, uh, aesthetic that I'm trying to describe. Uh, in other translations from the Chinese, uh, Pound, who didn't know Chinese, <coughs> uh, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that uh, next time, uh, uh, builds a, a kind of layered narrative out of discrete images uh, and finds a way to, in a sense, not simply create a, a poetry of radical compression, but rather a poetry that expands out of uh, this uh, imagistic uh, basis. Uh, the River Merchant's Wife, uh, a letter on 352, uh, is an example. It's one of the really great love poems of modern poetry. Uh, like the jeweled stairs grievance, it is a dramatic monologue for a female speaker. Uh, but these are different poems. By the end of this one, the wife speaks very directly, uh, not in reproach, uh, but in self-knowledge and pained desire. <coughs> the leaves fall early this autumn in wind. The paired butterflies are already yellow with August over the grass in the west garden. They hurt me. I grow older. If you are coming down through the narrows of the River Kiang, please let me know beforehand, and I will come out to meet you as far as Chofusa. Of the, of the paired yellow butterflies, the wife says with sublime simplicity, 
they hurt me, I grow older. It's possible to forget that the speaker who says this is 16, not 36. Uh, but her age makes no difference. She is already grasping, as you too will have, through, in this case, the pain of her separation from her husband, that uh, the essential experience of living in time is lost. <coughs> With this recognition, Pound's poem uh, reaches out of the confines of its imagism uh, towards something much <coughs> larger. Uh, and at the same time, you see him uh, carrying forward the, uh, the imagist's don'ts. Uh, this poem is a direct treatment of feeling. It uses absolutely no word that does not contribute to the presentation. And uh, it is composed in the sequence of the musical phrase, not that of the metronome, with those uh, dramatically varying line lengths. How Pound developed this poetics on a truly grand scale and the role that translation played in it, uh, these are things I'll discuss next time when we turn to the beginning of his epic poem, The Cantos.